Uh, my name is Chris Everett, and I am the program manager at the Southern Documentary Fund. Um, the Southern Documentary Fund is a nonprofit arts organization that cultivates documentary projects made in or about the American South. Inspired by our core belief that documentaries have the power to change lives and communities, we serve as a leading advocate for powerful Southern storytelling, providing filmmakers and artists with professional support, filmmaking grants, and fiscal sponsorship. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Music Supervision for Documentary Filmmakers with Aurelia Belfield of Trailblazer Studios. How can documentary filmmakers get through the process of clearing and gaining licensing rights to use music in a and executive producer Aurelia Belfield of Trailblazer Studios will give us an overview of the process of using music in your document. Um, so yeah, Aurelia, the, the, the floor is yours. Let's get started. Oh, hi. <laughs> Hi everybody, my name is Aurelia Belfield. Like, uh, like Chris mentioned, I am the music supervisor and um, executive producer in the audio department at Trailblazer Studios. And my main deal um, are documentary films and docu-series. I've been working on them for several years. And what I have found over these years is that, you know, there's a lot of really fantastic documentary filmmakers out there. And I know for a lot of you, you're working independently and that can be a heavy, heavy load. Um, trying to figure out a lot of things at once, right? And so, for me, as a music supervisor, I decided to focus on documentary films because that seemed like where folks could use the most help. It's a, it's a big lift and my job is to come in and take some of that stuff off your plate when you're thinking about where to find music, um, where to place it, how to license it, um, and how to do all of your deliverables right and proper, finding composers and all that good stuff. So what I am going to do just to give you all a decent foundation on what it is that I, my usual workflow on a doc project looks like, I'll take you through that step by step and then we can open up the floor to, to questions. Please keep putting those questions in the Q&A box. Um, they will absolutely get answered. But for right now, I'm just gonna lay a foundation. As questions come to your mind, just throw them, throw them in the box and we'll make sure that We'll make sure that you get an answer, okay? So the point where I come in, and I think, you know, people have worked with different music supervisors. All, everybody's gonna have their own unique style, but this is what I have found works best um, on the projects I've worked with, worked for and with the filmmakers that I work with is I like to come on as early as possible. I know that conventional wisdom might say that, you know, you're gonna film, you're gonna edit, and then you're gonna think about the rest of this stuff, right? Then you're gonna think about music and sound and all of that after, after, after you have a cut done. But what I found is actually most helpful is I'm coming in as early as, as is possible. I'm coming in during pre-production. We are having those creative calls early, knowing that things are malleable and things can change but at least I have these things on my radar so I can start keeping track and keeping an eye on certain things. And even that early, maybe you're dealing with a period piece or something like that where you have songs that you know for sure have to be included because they're a very important part of the story. That gives me your entire filming schedule to make sure that we can source it, to make sure that we can license it um, if we can't license it to find like some alternatives and you're not in the middle of a cut and then have to go back and patch stuff because we didn't have these conversations months and months before. So coming in during pre-production for that kind of thing and also coming in during pre-production to talk about what music style even looks like for, for this documentary. Do you want to do different genres, instrumentation, things you do and don't like? Are we licensing music? Are we, what's your budget? Where are we looking? Um, and so all of that stuff can happen before filming even begins. Again, knowing that the creative may change, but I like to come in that early for a few reasons. For the reason that I mentioned when it comes to licensing existing tracks that you know you're going to need, um, finding a composer and getting your composer in as early as possible for the same reason so they can live 
with this project as long as as long as you have and as long as I have and as long as your editors have and they have more of a connection to it. Um, and I think it gives a, a better product at the end of the day. Um, and also, so you have temp music. Um, I like to come in this early so I can get folks temp music, um, even knowing that you know you're going to have a composer and all all of it's going to be replaced, all, all of the stuff we already know, but coming in so that your editor can start with music in the project already. Uh, it's one less thing for you to think about. It's one less thing for your editor to have to think about. And it's the discussion has already happened in terms of style. So everything that's in the project is going to be a good fit. Your editor doesn't have to stop down what they're doing to find tracks to, to put in as they're cutting. Um, that stuff is already in the project. It's already nicely organized by things like mood and, and genre so they can have a much quicker and easier time placing music. Um, and you know, if you're in the very lucky situation where you also get to have a music editor, that person and I can work together to already get your temp score laid out before, um, before we even get to this point. But for the most part, most filmmakers I work with don't, don't have that luxury. So having your editor coming in prepared and temp music provided by me, we know that we can afford it, right? We know that it's pre-cleared. Um, we know that it's gonna be in budget. Uh, when you're sourcing temp music, you know, hither tither from all over the internet, you may end up with pieces of score from other films that are commissioned and, and can't be licensed. You might end up with tracks um, that are just exorbitantly expensive or tracks that nobody knows, you know, nobody knows who wrote it or where it came from. And it was just sort of floating around YouTube somewhere. And like I said, while we all know temp music is temp, I think we have all uh, also run into the situation where you find something and you've lived with it for so many months or sometimes so many years that you just really love it. And now nothing that your composer puts forth is going to, to live up to that first sensation of when you, when you heard this track and it just fits so well and why can't we just keep it? So to avoid that situation, we have things in there that you can keep or um, it's a bit of underscore where it's really just moving the scene along and it's not immediately like it's not pinging something for anybody and so you go through your whole offline edit process and suddenly it's like oh my gosh like this piece of tent music has been here this whole time and we've been so worried about everything else we didn't even notice it what are we going to do we've already spent all our money on everything else so to avoid these kinds of situations i come in i provide temp from my sources that we know we can use and we know we can afford because in pre-production, we've had the budget conversation and we've had the creative conversation. So everybody is coming into this as prepared as they can possibly be. Um, and then if you do have a composer, uh, if you have somebody in mind, that's great. I can work with them. I am here to, to serve the film and I'm here to help you as the filmmaker. I'm not here to, to push any agenda, uh, but that of the film itself. So if you come in with somebody that you're like, I really love them, I wanna work with them, then that's my job to work with that person. Um, and I have met really fantastic musicians doing that. Um, and if you're not in that kind of a situation, then that's what I'm here for, to help you find a composer that is a good fit for your project and give you a couple of options and that can happen earlier and earlier if, again, I'm involved in that pre-production conversation. So we know what style looks like. We know what the vibe is. I'm getting to know you more if, we're, if we don't already have a relationship so that we can make that connection and have that connection be a strong one. Um, so I'm not just cold calling people without uh, a whole a lot of knowledge about you and your communication style as a filmmaker or the creative style of the film in general. So I'm here to help you find a composer that works within your budget that you have and also working with you and them on spotting sessions, any demo music that they might wanna put in that's temp from either their existing library or stuff that they could whip up really fast for a specific scene. Um, this is another reason why it's really great to have a music supervisor and the composer 
even while you're still cutting, because if you're cutting something and the temp is just not it, or you want something really, really special, you can bounce out uh, an MOV to your music supervisor to lay something underneath it. If you're like, we really think a vocal track would work great here. Can you send us some options? Or sending that same MOV to your composer and they can mock up something really fast that might work. And so then you're working with original music for your project as opposed to trying to find temp music that's just not, that's just not working. And if you are working with a distributor or a network that can work to your advantage because you're not, you're, network execs and stuff are not getting hung up on music notes about music that's not even gonna be there at the end of the day. So it really just helps to move the project along a lot more smoothly when you have all of your team members in place as early as possible. So we've gotten our temp, we've gotten our composer, we have spotted, we are sending cuts back and forth, everything is going great. So at this point, we know what tracks are going where. We know if we're keeping any temp music at all, so I can contact those vendors and providers and get everything legal and finalized. Um, we already know that's gonna be in budget because we already set budget aside for that situation um, in case it happens. And if it ends up not happening and we just have lovely original music throughout your whole film, then that is money that can be put towards something else, like licensing, which at this point I'm clearing any um, commercial music that you want to purchase and use in your film. Um, we are here to have conversations and discuss licensing. What kind of licenses do we, do we need? Um, for how long? What are the terms? Um, what distribution are you expecting? So we can sort of map out a plan for all possibilities. Uh, and you're not having to do this in the midst of having to look at cuts and do notes and fundraise. <laughs> you're not having to do all of the licenses and clearances in addition to, to everything else. So I'm doing licenses and clearances. I'm negotiating those contracts for you. And then we have everything set to go. Everything is legal. Everybody is happy. Um, and then it's time for cue sheets, which I think we all know is a, just a time-coded log of every single piece of music in a production. And when I do that, I can submit to either the network who will then submit to performance rights organizations to make sure folks are getting their proper credit and their proper royalties or I am submitting these cue sheets to the PROs themselves if it's a completely independent distribution process. So that is the, the soup to nuts of what, of what my process usually looks like. This is how it tends to work the smoothest, um, the most efficient, and things just, you know, on your end, things just magically seem to happen and you don't have to worry about it. We just show up. Uh, and you have a beautiful film at the end of the day. Um, and let's see, so now I'm gonna open things up for questions. I'm sure that'll lead to more conversation. We got some, we got a lot of stuff already in the, in the Q and A box. So I'll start from the beginning. What is a good rate for a composer um, from a first time filmmaker working on a short? Okay, so the question becomes, what is your budget, right? What do you have? What do you think you can raise? There is going to be somebody that will work with you at nearly any given budget that exists. Now, are you going to get, are you maybe going to get the person with 30 years of experience and, you know, a bunch of films under their belt and, and maybe some awards? Maybe you're probably not going to get that person for, you know, a $5,000 budget, right? But you can still get the perfect match for your film and your budget that's gonna be beautiful. And maybe for you, you're a first time filmmaker, perhaps you're working with a first time composer and the two of you can grow together in your careers if you, if you hit it off well. Um, I generally speaking like to make the comparison of we are all artists here, right? Um, you, you're filmmakers, your composers are musicians, you would not want somebody to not pay you for your work, right? You wouldn't want somebody to ask you to, 
to make a short film for a hundred bucks, right? With all of the all of the work that goes into it, all of the folks you have to hire, the equipment you need, the time and labor. So I tend to think about it in those terms. I know music for a lot of folks can can be um, something that comes in the back of their mind that they're not really thinking about um, when they're going through their project, but you want to give your composers the same respect that you would that you would expect somebody to give you as an artist, right? As a filmmaker. Um, and the same deal when we're talking about things like fair use, which I, I'm sure there's probably a question about it in the in the Q and A box. But fair use is a is number one very specific, um, and there's not a lot of instances where it applies. Uh, there's some instances where it does, but I don't like to overuse fair use because like I was just saying, you wanna pay people for their work, right? You wanna pay people for your, their work and their art in the same way that you wanna get paid for your work and your art. So that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about where you want to, to set your budget and where you want to set your priorities. Now, if you have little to no money, there are so many fantastic, um, film programs and music programs, uh, especially in the North Carolina where I am, there's so many colleges um, and universities that have really great programs. And if your budget allow, only allows you to work with you know, a student composer, then you need to budget for that and also budget for the time that it's gonna take because it's gonna take a little bit longer and it's gonna be a little bit more of a process um, to work with somebody who this is their first time on on a professional project but like i said earlier um if you are open to that that's a beautiful relationship that can be built um the two of you can go alongside each other and go a really long way um, in your future projects all right and morgan um morgan do you provide temp scores for work in progress segments like that are set out for, sent out for grants. Okay, so this is a really, this is a good question because when we think about temp score, I like to use temp score like for all of the reasons that I mentioned. I actually, so technically when you're doing something like grant proposals or um, sizzle reels to send to networks, pitch pieces in general that are not going to be public facing, Right, they're not going to go on YouTube or Vimeo or on your website, then the world is your oyster. Nobody's going to see it except for you and the person that you're sending it to. Um, no, you don't have to have licenses for those necessarily. But what I do tend to caution against is using stuff that you know you can't afford because what you don't wanna do is sell a pitch on something that you cannot then realize at the end of the day. You don't want to, you don't want to put Beyonce in your pitch and then your distributor, your network executive really falls in love with that concept and then you can't deliver on it. Um, so I like to work within the bounds of stuff that, okay, if they really like this track, I I know that it's probably a reasonable, something that like we can reasonably budget for and reasonably clear. Um, or if it's mostly underscore, working with temp music and temp score, because again, if somebody really falls in love with it, then we can just take it all the way through. If you're looking at something like a series, um, and especially if it's like a longer running series, something that's like, you know, 20 episode season or something like that for uh, like a follow docuseries, you're probably going to be looking at especially for a larger network, you're gonna be looking at libraries. So what I like to do in that instance is use the library that I feel like is the best, is gonna be the best fit for the series in the pitch so that we can just moving forward, know what library we are going to use. And you can, you tend to get better rates that way. If you're approaching somebody for a pitch and saying, we really also want to use you for the larger project. Um, when you bulk buy things uh, like blanket licenses, the more episodes you have, the less it's gonna cost per episode. All right, I hope that answers your question. 
Morgan, um, Blanche. Uh, often there's no budget for music and pre-production. You are correct. And that is the point where I'm coming in to help you build that budget so that we can have a creative conversation. We know what creative we're trying to achieve. And so then we can budget appropriately for it. Um, that is the situation that tends to avoid disappointment, right? Because uh, development can be very pie in the sky. We all have big dreams and aspirations, but what I don't, what I hate to see is for folks get, to get really attached to an idea that they can't fundraise enough for, um, or just cannot find or make a budget for. Um, and then when you get into the process, it, it's not gonna turn out the way that you wanted um, or expected. So being able to match creative appropriately early enough um, and working with a music supervisor is gonna help you do that because they're gonna have an idea of what's clearable, what's affordable. If you're working with a particular distributor, what are their rules? Um, what, what do they require in terms of usage terms? So that if that knocks entire categories of artists or categories of labels out and you know you can't use them, you're not in a position to get attached to something that you can't use. And or you're bringing somebody in to bring you, you know, new ideas under the umbrella of the creative that you that you put forward. And you can get really excited about stuff early on and be able to see it through all the way. Right. And so Blanche, I do hope that answered your question. Um, if not, you can follow up in the in the Q&A box. Um, and OK. OK, we have a music production company. Uh, where's the best place to stage our track songs and music to find and utilize? Uh, it's the like everything else. Um, this is a relationship-based business. So what I tell folks that are pitching music, number one, know who you're talking to. If you're reaching out to a music supervisor, become familiar with their work. Do not send a form letter. I know that takes a little bit more time, but you're gonna get a better return on your investment of, of time, right? Um, and just come in and start to build a relationship with that person. It does not have to be a pitch out of the gate. Uh, I don't like transactional relationships. Um, I, I do like to feel like we have a bond and we can build off of that. Those are the people that I call the most often. So just being genuine, reaching out, knowing your catalog well, and knowing your catalog well enough so that you can target um, specific productions and individuals that you know are going to benefit from your catalog, as opposed to sending out a mass form letter to, you know, everybody on a particular listserv and 80% of them are not working on anything that is going to be really well served by, by what's in your catalog. And then as you get new stuff, you know, reevaluate and reach out to, to even more folks. Um, let's see. Oh, hello, Anson. I see you on here. Uh, Anson, how does the music supervisor get paid? Is it a, a percentage of the total budget or an hourly fee? So that can go a lot of different ways. Everybody has different preferences on how they do that. Um, it usually depends on the project itself. Some folks do do a percentage. So if you have a music budget available to you, some folks may say that they want, you know, a percentage of that total budget, which then gets set aside for their time and labor. And the rest of that can go towards licensing. This is something that you want to have a line item for when you're building out a budget. Um, some folks do hourly. I, hourly is a little bit more difficult. I tend to look at it the same way you would pay um, a producer or a post supervisor or anybody in that kind of soup to nuts role on a project where we're looking at um, day rates or we're looking at weekly rates. Um, there's also, depending on the production, a flat, just a flat rate um, for the entirety of the production, but being uh, clear and open with your communication so that you know like, okay, we only have this much, I can pay you a flat rate of this much, 
okay, well, this is what I can provide for that rate. Um, and if we go beyond the scope of the terms that we've discussed, then we can renegotiate um, a different rate. But generally speaking, I think the most beneficial thing, honestly, truly is a weekly rate uh, because there are gonna be lulls in, in the process. You might be you know, really hot and heavy in pre-production when you're talking about all of this creative. And then while you're shooting, unless you have like on camera stuff that you need to figure out, there might be a, a couple of weeks or months of a lull and then we pick back up. So I think overall a weekly rate, uh, a weekly rate or a flat rate seems to be uh, the most beneficial, especially for independent filmmakers. Um, all righty. Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. What are spotting sessions? Spotting sessions are, thank you for asking this, Liz Hoya. Uh, spotting sessions are when the production team, you, and for music specifically, it'll be director, producer, um, usually editor or edit team, uh, composer, um, and music supervisor. We're gonna sit, we're gonna watch a cut together, and we are going to go point by point and in a really early session say, okay, this is what the temp is doing that I like. This is what the temp is doing that I don't like. Like, we think that this would be a good fit for this scene, all of that kind of thing. And then as we start getting um, score in from our composer, then we're sitting and if, you know, Spotting sessions are great when you have time to do them. Otherwise, later spotting sessions, the most critical one is the beginning. So you can go through and actually talk out what you want each scene to be doing. Later spotting sessions, I find beneficial because you can sit and discuss with the composer in the room, like, you know, this is working, this is not working in terms of what it is that they've scored. However, I've worked on a lot of productions, a lot of television productions have very, very truncated schedules. Um, and in that case, I think it's beneficial to leave uh, time code notes if you don't have time to do later series spotting sessions with your composer with, with the original music. So something like Frame.io is great for time code notes. Vimeo is really good, uh, Dropbox, or just old school spreadsheet time code note. Um, what I've done in the past is our, we get an AAF from the composer that we can then uh, turn into a spreadsheet. So we have the time code and what file name, what track name is at that time code. So we make a spreadsheet of time code, file name, and then a section for notes. And so that's the, the you know, the most low tech way possible to, to get the result that you want. But always, always, especially as we enter into you know, living with COVID slash post-COVID times. If you can get together in person, that's great. If you're all in the same area or if you, you know, have the budget for travel, that's awesome. But you can, spotting sessions can be done by a Zoom. I've been doing them for the last over two years by a Zoom. And before that, we were doing a lot of remote work. Um, so they can be done by a Zoom or Google Hangouts. Um, and we're just sitting and, and having a conversation. All right, so hopefully that answered your question, Latoya. All right, uh, are there certain databases or websites that are recommended when looking to purchase royalty-free music? There's all kinds, there's so many. Um, so depending on what, you're, what it is you're looking for, so if it's an ad or if it's, uh, but we're mainly talking about like feature length docs and doc series, you're gonna to wanna to look at places that have blanket options, right? Um, and those are gonna be like production music libraries um, is what they call them. And the larger ones tend to be the ones that maybe don't necessarily show up if you're only looking, if you're only Googling things like royalty-free music, because there's a, there's a lot of um, libraries out there at every possible scale imaginable. Um, so there's the production music, is the Production Music Association, I think, Production Music Guild, um, they have a good list of like large scale and medium scale vetted 
uh, production music libraries. I think one of our friends in here um, has their own uh, production music catalog. Um, there's a lot of independent uh, vendors and retailers. Uh, this is part of why I like to get brought onto a project because then you don't have to trawl through 20 pages of Google trying to figure out, you know, what's a good fit, who's legit, all of all of that sort of thing. But there are a lot of options out there. You know, all the major labels have production music arms, not major publishers, I should say, have production music arms. So Universal Music has a production music library. Sony Music has a production music library. Um, for smaller scale stuff, there are, the subscription libraries have become a lot more popular. I think they are, a, they are, they can be a little bit controversial depending on who you're talking to. Um, but for ads and shorts, especially, um, I think they can be a good resource. Um, and for folks that are, you know, just starting out, so you can pay a, a, either a monthly fee or an annual fee, and it gives you access to their entire library for you to use as you see fit. I don't recommend leaning on them for most things or everything because like we were talking about earlier, I like to pay people for their work um, as much as possible. And when you're using those options, folks are not necessarily, the artists are not necessarily seeing um, those royalties on the back end because it's royalty free music. Um, so I, the biggest suggestion that I give, unless you have, you know, next to zero dollars, like small budget versus no budget can be a big difference. Um, if you have a small budget, I would recommend um, seeking out a composer so that you can do original music for your piece. Um, if that's not a possibility for you, then obviously uh, royalty free music uh, libraries are, are a good option. All right. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so we, I see something here in the chat. Production Music Association also. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for letting us know that that's good information. Uh, Ray is asking, what range of fees should we put in our budget for a music license person? Okay. Um, this is going to be like everything else, which I... I think um, no matter who you talk to in the film industry, this is always gonna be the answer. It depends. It depends on the person and it depends on the project. Um, I like to make things work as often as I can. And like I, I think I answered Anton's question earlier, it's about being open and honest with your communication and knowing what you need from that person. So are, do you need them to only, like you already have music in place, you only need them to do clearances and licenses. Um, are they sourcing temp music for you? Do you already have a composer? Um, or have you already been working with a composer and you're bringing in a music supervisor at the last minute for some other reason? Think about like, do you want the whole shebang or are there individual tasks that you need addressed that that's gonna give you an idea of, of budget? But generally speaking, um, I think if we're gonna do rules of thumb, I would look at what would you pay a producer, right? Doesn't have to be an EP. What would you pay, you know, a post producer? What would you pay a post supervisor? Um, that's going to be the range and scale that you're looking at because that's going to be uh, the same relative amount of lift for this particular role. It's just in a different department. All righty. Um, doo -doo -doo. Oh, okay. I see here. Okay. Okay, Michelle, I think I'm pronouncing your name right. I hope I am. You have all the inside information. You're on the PMA Composer Advisory Board, and they are a great organization. They're super helpful, especially for folks that are just starting out um, and don't really know where to, where to look or where to go. Um, so next up is Eric. Hello, Eric. Um, can, uh, music that might be heard in the background of the scene. Okay. So whew, that's, that's a big one, there's a lot. Um, so when you're dealing with um, like diegetic music, music that is like in the Nat sound, like in a scene, um, number one, first things first, 
if you have the ability to control that environment, then do so. If you're going into an environment and you have the ability to decide what's being played, um, if it's a party, if it's in the car, this is where some of those smaller libraries or even subscription libraries may be beneficial to you. Um, they're using independent artists that are making the same kinds of music that they would you know, put on an album. So if you have folks that are particular about a certain sound, you know, going that route to say, this is what we're gonna play in the car uh, can, can be something that you can do. Um, so number one, if you can control the environment, control it. Uh, we have been in this situation before. I have pulled, you know, uh, tens of tens of tracks, long playlists for people to take to parties or to different events of stuff that we know we, we have cleared um, is in our blanket or we know we can clear. Um, and that's just what's playing at this party. And this is you you get what you get. And now we don't have to worry about um, getting in hot water with licensing. Um, if you don't have that kind of control, um, fair use is an option for you. Please talk to your lawyer about fair use. Don't assume. Don't talk to Google Esquire about what fair use laws look like. Um, that person's going to be able to give you the best answer on what fair use is. Generally speaking, if the scene is very short and the music is very, very obscured to the point where it's not really identifiable at all, you may have a strong fair use case. If it is very prominent and there is just nothing you can do about it, uh, my suggestion would be to use that as B-roll, if at all possible, um, and put um, interview over it, uh, if you're worried about being able to license this particular track. But I would plan, if, it's, if that is the situation, I would plan on licensing it, honestly, uh, because this is gonna take us through the whole thing. You don't know who is going to watch your work. Uh, when it, if, and you might think, oh, it's just a small film festival or it's just a small screening. You don't know who's going to be there um, for good and for bad. You don't know who's going to be there and love it and want to distribute it. Um, and then you have a bunch of stuff that maybe you didn't license. And, and that makes that negotiation process harder because they didn't expect to have to pay more money on top of what they're offering you for this acquisition. Right. And on the flip side of that, you don't know who is going to be there and who has some claim over a piece of music and a project and is litigious um, and is going to want to take you to court over they want a particular amount of money for something for whatever reason. And even if you have a strong fair use case, you still have to go to court. Um, and that still costs money. So at the end of the day, you can win your fair use case and that's great and you can continue to use um, that piece of music, how you've been using it, but you still have all these other fees that you've now racked up that maybe you weren't expecting. So I tend to be very, very conservative and put this in a better safe than sorry kind of situation. So I hope that answered, um, I hope that answered the bulk of that question. Um, John, what kind of range of fees should a producer budget for a music supervisor? Okay. I think we answered this earlier. Um, it really and truly depends. It depends, just like with composers, it depends on how much experience the person has and the portfolio of tasks that you're asking them to do. Um, again, I, if you're wanting to compare line item to line item, it's look at what you're paying your post supervisor or what you're paying your post producer. Um, and because market rate for music supervisors can range because there's folks that are working on nothing but shorts, right? Nothing but independent shorts. And what they're getting paid is going to be different than the person that's working on big budget studio films. So it's in extremely wide range. Um, and in terms of market rate, if you're looking to match something, I would look at post-producer, post-supervisor, um, line items as something to sort of gauge around and that particular market research as well. Um, 
that the, those those fees tend to be a little bit more stable in terms of what you're looking at in terms of range, right? Cool. So, okay. How deep does the commercial licensing work for the music? For example, if I have 10 minutes, 10 seconds of a known of, yes, you do. You need, if you have music in your film, you need to license it. Just full stop. Um, if you can't afford it, you need to find an alternative piece of music. Uh, and there's all sorts of alternatives out there. Just because it's not your first choice doesn't mean you can't find something fantastic that maybe even works better than, than what worked off of the top of your head in the first place. But yes, 10 seconds doesn't matter. You gotta, you gotta pay some money for it. If somebody were to cut 10 seconds out of your film and put it in their project and then not pay you for it, you'd feel some kind of way. <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and assume. So viewing it through that lens, I think helps put that in perspective. Yes, you do need to pay them. Uh, Malika. Uh, I know it's focused on dots, but you see the process being a lot different for narrative. Um, yes and no. There are different things that, that come up in narrative. Um, for features, there is a nice thing where I can get a script really early. So we're talking about like in that pre-pro process, there's actually scripts that um, I can go through and we can meet about and decide, you know, oh, this would be a great place for a uh, piece of music like this. And so we can have that built out already uh, because we know where the story is headed and we know what kind of story it already is. Uh, but generally speaking, um, it's, a, it's a similar process. You also probably have um, a bigger crew than you would uh, on a doc. So then you might be able to have a music editor come in and and get that temp score ready and all that good stuff but yeah it's a sim it's a similar process um the the biggest difference would be things like number one uh schedule but in even in doc series like those schedules working in reality those schedules are so truncated that i think it's an easier transition transitioning out of reality into narrative than the other way around um but you still have those weekly like they are in post for something that is up against air the next week and maybe you have to to swap some stuff out but that process is still really similar to what you're already dealing with with um other genres of television show so i think the biggest difference with scripted is you get to deal with the script which i think is a benefit <laughs> to everybody overall um all righty uh union versus non-union rates so uh, for music supervisors specifically, uh, we don't have a union yet. Uh, we have the Guild of Music Supervisors, which I'm very proud to be a part of and serve on their diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. Uh, but no, we do not have, we don't have a union yet. And so that's part of the reason why there's not necessarily set rates uh, for a range of fees. Uh, folks are trying to, to change that but that has yet to happen. So Dave, I do not have a, I do not have a good answer for you for that. Um, let's see. Now, what I can tell you is if you're working in a narrative feature, uh, if you have um, musicians that are on screen, you're gonna have to make sure that they're getting their proper SAG credit. Um, and if you have folks that have been on screen multiple times, you have to keep that in mind if you're trying to hire them for a non-union project that they might be in, they might be in the Screen Actors Guild. All righty. Um, Richard, same question, but other formats. Wait, Richard, what was your first question? I'm so sorry, I've gone through other question. Doc series versus one hour episode versus for what? I will, and if you can throw that in the, um, if you can throw that in the chat, composer rates. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, that those can vary because again, the labor is gonna be different. The amount of labor is gonna be different. The amount of product provided is going to be different. Um, so yeah, if you, if it is an hour, that is gonna cost less 
usually than, you know, a four hour uh, mini series or a two hour feature uh, that is going to be less of a lift. And with that in mind, if you're trying to think about how to, if you have a certain fixed budget in mind, um, there's ways around it. So you can go to this person and say, I want themes. I want, you know, if it's a TV series, maybe you want an open, a close, and you want your like bumpers and, and teases. And maybe those are all original music. So you have like a nice branded package of what your project is going to sound like. And then other underscore is coming from a production music library. Um, so if you really want to make, make your film unique, but you have a fixed budget in mind and you can't, and you're just not finding what you need um, in terms of getting somebody to score it overall, there are ways and means, and folks tend to want to work with you. Like people can be very flexible. Uh, $500, probably not enough, but I would say, I would start at around 3000 for most, like at average, like if, if it's like an hour, right? If it's like an hour or less, um, you can probably get somebody um, for, for that rate, but obviously more is going to be better. Um, and for looking at a doc series, a, a series of one hours, then we're looking at, you know, 20 to 25K plus per episode. Um, that's going to be your average for, for network productions. And, uh, and like I said before, this can range wildly. Like you can, folks come in and, you know, just like they bring in big name producers and directors, they can bring in Hans Zimmer and maybe Hans Zimmer's getting a million dollars an episode. So it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to assess, but if there's somebody that you want to work with specifically, if there's somebody that you want to work with, reach out to them have a conversation with them. It's not embarrassing. Tell them what your situation is and they might be able to work with you and or recommend somebody that's at a different phase in their career that might be more amenable to the rate that you're looking at. Um, and again, this is a great way to plug, even if not me, uh, a music supervisor who can figure out the preliminaries of this conversation for you. Um, all right. Gia, is there a template for a composer? A template? Um, I don't understand your question, Gia. I'm going to be honest with you. A template for composer and music supervisor that are a good start. No, it's just going to depend. Like you're going to, if, if you don't have a composer already, you're going to want to find your music supervisor first. Um, and if you do have a composer in mind, you just bring them in early, let them talk it out. And um, everybody can connect and start to, to vibe with each other and build those relationships. Um, Alicia, PBS Music Licensing Agreement for a short doc, festival distribution. Uh, so Alicia, you're using the PBS Music Licensing Agreement for a short doc, but you're thinking ahead for festival distri distribution, which is a good thing. Um, can music supervision be something that you put off? I, I mean, obviously in my heart of hearts, I'm going to tell you no, but, uh, if, if, if you must, um, if this is something that's finished and you're only looking to do licenses and clearances, you can find a license and clearance person, or you could find a clearance house, um, that will provide those services for you. If you're not in need of any creative services. I would also caution against that. Find a music supervisor because if you think you're going to be in a situation where you have stuff in your doc that maybe uh, once you get outside of PBS's licensing agreement may be out of range for your budget, then you're going to want somebody on the creative end to help you find alternative tracks that, that do the same thing for your story. Uh, and that's something that I will tell everybody is try and future-proof your film as much as humanly possible. Um, most major distributors are going to want all media in perpetuity rights. Most of the time, if it's a streamer, it's not including theatrical. I've 
just to be safe, make things as broad as possible and include theatrical. So all media in perpetuity, including theatrical worldwide. That is what most distributors are going to look for when they're looking at acquisitions. Uh, when you are budgeting and when you are thinking about creative, think about things that you can use that you can access with those kind of really broad usage terms. Um, I don't recommend festival budgets or festival licenses unless it's absolutely necessary. They're there. They do very good things, but you also have to be prepared to have alternatives if needed um, after festival season is over if you're looking to use something that you know you're not going to be able to have budget for at the end of the day. Uh, so future proof, make those agreements as broad <laughs> as you can think of. Um, all right. In ARA, when musical group who composed the track doesn't exist anymore, how to proceed? Um, so if we're thinking about um, like a commercial track that's like off of an album or something, folks still own it, right? So it's just a matter of going down that research rabbit hole. Um, normally, they're going to be uh, signed with a, with a particular performance rights organization like ASCAP or BMI. Um, so you can look to their repertories and find who is listed as the, as the writer composer, who's listed as the publisher. Um, so you can go to the publishers and figure out who, you know, that's who you're going to pay for your sync rights. For your master rights, you're going to look at the label, what album did this come off of? Um, then you're going to figure out the label, if the label is defunct, who bought them after the fact. Um, and if you can't find any of that information, it's, you can go to the publisher and ask, you can ask around in general, um, or you can contact, you know, the last, you know, known contact and, uh, try and figure it out from there. It can be a hefty process, which is why it's nice to have somebody else doing it when you're in the middle of trying to make a film. Uh, but if, if you can't find it, or if you're in a situation where there's multiple writers, multiple publishers, there's that one guy that owns 3% of, of the track and he is just not having it. He doesn't want anything to do with it. He doesn't, he's not interested in, in being in a film. Unfortunately, you have to find something else. That, that 3% guy can hold up everybody else, unfortunately. And if he's just not going to budge after trying and trying, then you just have to move on to the next thing. Um, Chase, when you look for a composer, where do you start? Do you go to an agency? I use my Rolodex because uh, I'm lucky enough to have one. Um, again, big benefit of working with a music supervisor. You have all of their relationships available to you. Um, if that's not the case, you know, talk to other filmmakers, you know, you, especially like SDF is such a fantastic community. Um, I know you guys do stuff all the time. And so talk to each other, keep in touch with each other. If somebody has, somebody might have a composer that they really loved working with or a friend who's a composer or anything like that, like get to know people. And that's how you can sort of build out who you think you might want to work with. And even if you don't know people, if there's a film that you really love, reach out to that, reach out to the filmmaker, reach out to the composer, you know, start to start building out those relationships. This is a networking industry. I hate the word networking. I think it's relationship based industry. So start getting out there and making friends. Um, diegetic music. I have a scene where character is working on a truck and singing along to a song. Uh, that is not fair use. Um, they're singing along to a song um, that is playing on the radio, and she says that it describes her marriage. That is not fair use. So fair use uh, criticism is really specific. It has to be an almost educational criticism of a piece of music. Uh, just saying this reminds me of my marriage is not enough to make a really strong fair use case. Now your lawyer may be able to find some other language that makes a stronger case, but I would caution against trying to do that. Um, and what I would tell you to do instead, like if you can license it, great, you need to license it. 
um, if you can't license it, then you need to have an alternative patch on deck uh, where you maybe go back in and do another interview and she can talk about, she can mention the song and talk about it. And you can have that playing over your scene as B-roll. Um, all right. Live, what, okay, what do I mean by music libraries? So music libraries are literally just uh, repositories for a ton of of music, production music libraries are all over the place. Um, and they have music from all different genres, um, different composers, um, some work with artists directly in terms of like bands or vocalists. Uh, and those are the places where you're going to go and um, you're gonna get a license through them to, to use something that is in, that's in their repository, in their library. Um, is the process similar on podcasts? Uh, yes, still got to license music for podcasts. Um, podcasts can get interesting. Um, some folks are starting to have podcast licenses, which can be beneficial, but generally speaking, yes, the process, the process is the same. I do think it, it, you can find composers for podcasts too, and would absolutely recommend that, but same process, different medium. Uh, in my work as a music, in your work as a music supervisor, do you work with filmmakers to negotiate a composer's rate? Yes, that is part of my job. So I am a, anything that has to do with, so the same way a post supervisor, everything that has to do with post, they touch that. Anything that has to do with music in your project, I am going to touch it. I am negotiating composer contracts. I am negotiating that with the network if, it, if that's what it takes. Um, we normally with a filmmaker, I'm having a conversation early enough that they say, this is what we have budgeted for a composer. And then I can say, okay, I know somebody that's going to work within this particular budget. Um, so it's less of a negotiation, but I have been in situations where I've had to negotiate back and forth a composer's contract and their terms. And I do do that happily. Um, what is a typical rate for a music supervisor? Okay, uh, I think we have already addressed this question, Brittany. Um, it can range quite a bit. I would recommend a weekly rate and I would recommend if you're comparing apples to apples, um, looking at what you would pay a post supervisor or post producer. Um, Lisa, uh, do you think a thousand dollar song for a new PBS unscripted series seems like a fair rate for all usage unknown indie artists? Um, okay, so if they're not signed to anybody or they're not, um, they own their publishing, so they own their masters, they own their publishing and you're dealing with them directly, you can open up that line of communication and have that conversation um, and see. Uh, Start with a rate that you feel comfortable with. If, if, if $1,000 is a rate that you feel comfortable with, then go in and ask. Um, they may they're going to tell you yes or no. That is the only, those are the only two answers that they can give you. Um, and that's okay. And if you come back later with more money, you can always have that conversation again. Lowballing somebody is not immediately gonna, like they're not gonna kick you out just because you've lowballed them as long as you're approaching them respectfully. And knowing like, this is not a ton of money, but we really want to use this. Uh, are you flexible? What are, what terms would you be amenable to? And they can either say, cool, this is, they can counter offer with, you need to do this, this, and this, or they can say, I'm sorry, no. Uh, and, and that is your answer. It depends, it really depends on the artist. Um, some folks would be thrilled to see a thousand bucks for usage. And some folks are going to say, I'm sorry, that's just not going to work for us. Um, if you have in-house composers that are creating original music, what do you need to be thinking about to make sure original work is registered and licensable for the future? Um, you need to make sure they're set up with a PRO, performance rights organization. Um, you need to either you, the company, if, you, if, if this music is commissioned for you as a company, then you also need to register with the PRO uh, as a publisher. If you are not intending to, to own this, or if you're intending to split publishing, make sure that your artists 
also has um, a publishing entity that is registered with a PRO so that you can then register the stuff with ASCAP and BMI and make sure that you are backing up all of your files um, and making a decent database, making sure that there's metadata uh, attached to all of these files so that they're easier to search uh, in the future and just trying to set up something that's clean and, and easy to access. Uh, if I want to license a song that uses vocals of a BMI registered artist, will BMI reach out to me when they see my show air? Huh, or the song on my, or, and so, okay, I'm gonna read this out loud. If I want to license a song that uses the vocals of a BMI registered artist, will BMI end up reaching out to me when they see my show air? My understanding is that they don't deal with broadcasts or the song on my Spotify soundtrack. And if so, if I just provide them with the license agreement I've made with the artist for all usage, will I be good to go? Trying to license everything through indie artists directly and make the process simple. You, BMI is not gonna react, reach out to you most likely. Well, depending on who's just, who's distributing. If you're the distributor, distributor then yes. Um, if a network is the distributor, that, that's gonna end up falling on the network. If you have you have the license agreements, so you're covered. What you need to do in terms of dealing with BMI or ASCAP or CSAC or whoever PRO, you need to make sure that you have a Q sheet, um, and you need to make sure that number one, all the songs are registered with BMI, and that you are submitting your Q sheet to the performance rights performance rights organization, so that they have a log and that they are aware of the usage. Um, can I name a specific music library? Uh, Universal Production Music, um, one that people go to a lot. Um, APM Music Library, Extreme Music Library is the is Sony's music library, and then there's smaller stuff like Manhattan Production Music, uh, Signature Tracks, all all sorts and kinds. Um, does music supervisor and composer work in tandem? Yes, we do, and we love it. Um, my job is to make things easier for everybody. They make things easier for you as a filmmaker and make things easier for the composer to just focus on um, their art and not have to deal with uh, a bunch of legal stuff and a bunch of back and forth negotiations and, and dealing with uh, 55 different notes from 55 different places. Um, so we tend to like working with each other quite a bit. I love original music. Uh, I push for original music all the time. My job is not to say we can do everything with library music or I will just license a bunch of stuff for you. We all have our specialties and I think that's what makes a good team and a, and a good film at the end of the day. Um, what considerations should a filmmaker make with regard to original music agreements, ownership, licensing, and paying and working with musicians and their agreements? So normally you're making a deal with a composer and that comes with, that's, that's the shebang. Uh, the way I like to work is I will figure out the offer. Some, so depending on the network, some folks are gonna require things like work for hire, um, which means that the network or production company at the end of the day is, uh, owns the publishing share of that piece of music. A lot of networks do this, um, and that means that they own it. Nobody else can can use it um, in another production that's not part of part of this network's agreement. Um, or it can be something that's non-exclusive. So then that's something that your composer can put in their library to use for other projects in the future. And you can put a timestamp on that, so it can be not it can be exclusive up until a year after air or whenever so these things can expire and then they can use that work for other for other projects um writer share is always going to go to your composer um you decide how they you and them will decide how, how they would like to get paid is it a lump sum i like to do half at a certain my you know half at the beginning and another half at the end or break it up into quarters at, at certain milestones that works well um, and in terms of the musicians that they're using, that is on them. You are not hiring their musicians. 
um, you're hiring the composer and however that that work then gets done, that is how it's going to get done. You're hiring them to do a job. Um, but that is a thing to think about when you're thinking about budgeting for a composer. Um, they have to hire musicians unless they play every single instrument imaginable. They have to uh, pay for studio time if they don't have a home studio. Um, and if they do have a home studio, um, they are maybe taking time out of their day and not taking other jobs to work on your job. But so they're paying musicians, they are making sure their um, instruments are in good shape, um, all of that stuff and all that stuff costs money, just like making a film, you have to pay for your crew, you have to pay for your equipment, you have to pay for all of that stuff. Composer is on the other end doing the exact same thing. So, so keep that in mind um, when you think about how far um, money can go. So things can be done with electronic instruments, but that is nothing that is completely uh, like, that's not gonna replace everything. Um, and it's still money, it's still time. It's still time, it's still labor. So even if they're working with electronic instruments and they're not having to hire a bunch of live musicians, that's still a lot of time and a lot of effort and, and a lot of lift on them as an individual to compose something final. And then they're mixing it and they're mastering it. And they're giving you stems, which is every single instrument isolated so that you can, if you have to move things around or remix things, they're available to you. So it's a, it's a lot, it's a lot of work. So that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about um, budgeting for that. But every agreement is gonna be between you and your composer. So that there's not a standard, there, there will be standards when you're dealing with certain distributors and they will let you know what they are. But every agreement is bespoke. Every agreement is personal. Um, how do you evaluate a good music supervisor? What questions should we ask them um, when you first speak with them? Um, familiarity with certain genres, if there's genres that you really like to use um, for your project so that you know that they are able to work quickly and dig around and find um, good alternatives if you need to find alternatives. Um, if they're familiar with doing cue sheets, if they're familiar with um, licensing from major labels, um, if they're familiar with contract negotiations, um, think about all the tasks that you need for your project and ask that. And at, so, I cannot objectively tell you what is a good music supervisor, right? That's, a, that's something that is subjective. There are things that I do um, that work for me and work for my clients that other people don't do. And that doesn't mean that I'm better at it or worse at it. It just is the relationship that I have. I do music editing a lot of the time and there's a lot of fantastic music supervisors out there that work on all sorts of things that don't do that. And they work with an individual music editor specifically. So it's a matter of having these conversations with folks, um, knowing what you need, knowing what you're looking for, and seeing if that connection is there to be made. Because this is not transactional. Like this is, this is still a creative position and you wanna make sure that your creative visions align as well. Like there are folks, I, I have the experience that I have and I have interviewed for, you know, for certain projects that I've been called in for and I wasn't the right fit and it wasn't, it had nothing to do with my experience, but, you know, it could be a, a whole number of things. It just didn't work out for this project. Maybe it'll work out for the next one, right? So this is, it, it, it is a gut feeling of if you feel like you can, can get along with this person, do they take notes well? Um, how quickly are they working? That, all of that kind of thing. Um, on a doc feature that's fully funded backed by a large network, what might you expect a smaller total music budget to be by a bigger music budget? So big music budgets can go all, do who knows? It, it can be a lot of money. It can be millions of dollars. Um, a smaller total music budget for a doc feature that's gonna include stuff like licensing is gonna look more like uh, 40 to 50 K then that's small, small. Um, I think average is going to look more like 80 to a hundred thousand. Um, and I, 
If I were dealing with a decent sized network, that is the minimum that I would look for. That's the minimum that I would fight for would be a hundred thousand. It's going to make your life a lot easier. It's going to make a lot more things available to you. Um, and it, at the end of the day, it is also to me, for me to go off on another tangent, we have a handful more questions. I'm not going to keep you here all day. I promise. Um, but at the end of the day, think about it like this. And this is the way that I approach things. Like I have my fee, my fee is my fee. Um, music licensing budget is not going into like, just like with the rest of your production budget that does, you don't get to pocket that money at the end of the day. Like that's not, that's not, that doesn't go to your fee as a filmmaker. So, and even if you're dealing with independent artists that are not gonna command a high amount of money, coming in with a decent budget and being able to offer, you know, what might amount to six months of somebody's rent uh, is always going to be what I'm, what I want to go for. Right. So if I can get a hundred thousand dollars, even if I know I'm going to be working with small indie artists, I still want to pay them, um, you know, 10, 20, $30,000. Um, if we have the budget for it, because I love to pay artists for their art. I want filmmakers to make, you know, I want independent filmmakers to make more money. I want all artists to make more money. So anytime that we can facilitate that, that's great. And then it also ends up taking you farther because you, you're building out your reputation as somebody that people want to work with. Um, okay, we answered that. Uh, do composer music supervision rates differ based on location? Uh, I would say not necessarily. Um, I mean, places have higher standards of living. So folks that live somewhere that has a higher standard of living, a higher cost of living, um, probably will command more money. They're gonna ask for more money because they need more money to survive. Um, so keep that in mind. But just like what I was talking about before, when we're talking about paying artists, don't, find it just find a budget and stick with it if you need to raise LA money but you end up paying for somebody in Minnesota then okay it's not it's not harming anybody um to be able to do that especially now um since we're living in the time of remote work um the reputation that you're going to build as somebody who pays people in LA and New York one thing and pays folks in Austin and Charlotte something else is not the reputation that you want to build out in the community at large. Um, and composer rates and music supervisor rates are going to be different. What you're going to pay a composer is usually going to be flat. Um, what you're going to pay a music supervisor is going to be weekly, and they're going to be different numbers um, because they're going to come out of different parts of a budget. Usually those are different line items. So with music, you tend to have three or four different line items. It's going to be your music supervisor, your composer, um, your music licensing budget, and maybe a music editor. That's going to be your music department, um, general minimum line items. Um, and yeah, I mean, I know directors and editors that live all sorts and kinds of places, especially post, post COVID that they, you know, moved out of LA, but it didn't change their rate. They're, they're getting paid what they feel like they're getting paid and you need to think about it as value to your project as opposed to I don't want to pay New York money so I'm going to find somebody that lives in Kansas that person in Kansas is putting in the same amount of work that money might go farther in Kansas but that is their decision to live there it's not your decision to to find somebody uh, in that in that regard but um if you if budget is an issue I would look more towards experience than I would towards location. Um, you might find somebody in LA that's just starting out that might be a great fit for your budget, as opposed to somebody with 15 years of experience that just happens to live in Maine. Um, okay. Do I have a template for a music cue sheet? There's lots. Um, every network uh, has different requirements for their music cue sheets. Some of them use specific softwares and portals that they have to use. Um, I have a tendency to, if you wanna just set something up in general in a spreadsheet, it is time code, it is track title, 
It is track usage, you know, background instrumental, background vocal, main title theme, closing theme, segment theme, um, writer, you know, writer composer, um, their PRO, and the and the that's going to include their PRO and the percent. So if it's two people, it's whatever the the percent share of the writer share, and then the publisher their PRO and those splits. That's what the, the, that's what's required to be in in a music cue sheet. Um, you can get fancy with it, add all kinds of other things, but the, the, those are the basic requirements. Um, template for a filmmaker to use. I mean, I can I can provide you a couple, but I don't know that it's going to be incredibly helpful because it's just going to be the same information. It's just time code, you know, start time, end time duration of each cue, track title, usage, writer, composer. And these are just your different columns. Um, Alexa, I'm a filmmaker and a composer. Do I need to license the music I compose for my own films? Um, if you are dealing with a distributor or an acquisition, those need to be different line items, just so things don't get muddled and confused. Um, when you're being asked for certain things. Um, so if you're working in both roles, if you're wearing both hats, they do still need to be separate line items. I would suspect that they also need to be separate line items for tax purposes. Um, do, I, do you need to license music from yourself? If you're doing original music, you don't need to license it from yourself, but that needs to be a separate agreement so that you have it documented, that you need to have what that line item is and what, what your expected fee is. And then you still need to register everything um, with your PRO as usual and submit the cue sheet to the PRO as, as usual. But um, if it's existing music, if you own the master and the publishing rights, I would still tell you to get a license for it, just even if you just write it out so that you have documentation. Documentation is vitally important. Um, oh, you're welcome, Blanche. Um, do I take care of licensing things outside of music? I don't. So music supervisors, music supervisors are going to deal with music. If you have other sorts of licensing, like do you have archival producers that deal with archival licensing? And then when we come to like general things, like you're asking for a poetry reading. So that would be if that would usually be considered archival because it's an existing video clip. Um, those are, that's who you're usually gonna go for. And if you don't have an archival producer, that's something that your post supervisor or line producer can take care of. All right, uh, I think we've answered everybody's questions unless there are other questions to be had. Yeah, I think that's it. I know I had one, uh, I think like two for myself. Uh, I know a friend of mine, She's actually uh, working on a project. She wanted me to ask you this. I think it's kind of wild, <laughs> but uh, you know, she was interested in maybe getting someone like Megan Thee Stallion to try to do a track or a record, you know, for her. Okay. Family. Like, what would be the best way for her to kind of approach that situation from a music supervisor standpoint? Um. Well, you just gotta uh, ask management, right? You gotta okay. if if she doesn't have a personal relationship with the artist. Right. go to management like you would for because this is not necessarily a sync issue right. um the artist issue so go to their management and you know if they have a separate booking manager you can talk to them about that but yeah it's yeah, going to management and starting the conversation there and if if that particular manager for somebody like megan she might have right. different managers business managers for for different aspects um they'll point you to the right person Cool, cool. I'll let them know. <laughs> Thanks. Also, you know, this this actually got me um, wanting to be a, a music supervisor. <laughs> so, so folks out there that might want to, you know, go down this path, saying, you know what, this this sounds interesting. I like music. You know, I like what this is about. You know, after hearing, you know, this convo, I guess what's the best way for folks saying, you know what, I might want to go down this path of being a music supervisor. What's the best way to do that? I would suggest going to the Guild of Music Supervisors. Um, and it's just, if you Google Guild of Music Supervisors, it should be the first, first thing up there. Um, 
they, you know, like most of the guilds, they have, uh, and, and they have entry requirements. However, um, they do have a listserv that you can sign up. Um, you just put your email in there for free. Cool. And then you can stay updated on any upcoming events, um, any professional development things that that may come up. And I think that's usually the best way to to get started and um, start developing relationships with folks. Obviously, you know, follow people that you're interested in on social media, um, keep in touch with folks that way. But I think the guild as you know, the main point of contact for for folks that are trying to get into this part of the industry. Cool, cool. But yeah, I enjoyed this today. Um, I got a lot of, um, the, the questions was great from everyone. I know I learned a lot of stuff today. Um, and I just wanna thank everyone for participating you know, with the questions. Um, I got a lot out of it as a filmmaker. Um, I'm excited you know, to, to explore you know, more of this type of stuff with my own projects. I know our filmmakers are, um, I have my email in the chat box um, if folks are interested in learning more about Southern Documentary Fund. You know, we have an excellent um, fiscal sponsor program. If you have a project out there that you're looking for fiscal sponsorship, email me and we can have that discussion. Um, also, I want folks to don't forget to join us on March 31st at 12 p.m. Eastern time for a, our next mentorship roundtable with Alexis Galfis of Synetic Media. And she's gonna be doing a session on pitching your documentary to investors. So um, makers out there, if you have a documentary looking for funding, trying to figure out ways to pitch to investors and find funds for your project, definitely join us on March 31st at 12 o'clock Eastern time um, for that. And I'm gonna put a registration, oh, Dana already beat me to it. <laughs> so Dana just put the, the registration form for that for the March 31st session. Um, but again, I just want to thank you, um, Aurelia, that for, for this session. Um, this was, this was great. I thank yeah. you for all the questions. These are great questions, everyone. I hope I got you the answers that that you need. Um, and you can feel free to, you know, follow me on on Instagram or and follow Trailblazer Studios on Instagram and reach out if you have any other any other questions or or want to collaborate on something in the future. Well, awesome, awesome. Sounds good and. Thank you again, everyone, for attending our webinar today, um, Music Supervision for Documentary Filmmakers with Aurelia Belfield. Have a good day. Peace, everyone. <laughs>